In our previous explosions lab, we used two low friction carts with an integrated spring and we started both at rest touching one another. And we triggered this compressed spring and so it launched each of these cars uh, away with some kind of velocity. We changed the mass of the blue cart and we changed the mass of the red cart. Uh, and we found out that when the mass of the blue car was twice as massive as the mass of the red car, it moved away from the explosion event with half the velocity as that of the red car. If both cars had the same mass, they moved off with the same velocity. We found out uh, that the product of each car's mass and the velocity they attained after the explosion was identical. And so the mass of the blue car times its velocity was equal to the mass of the red car times its velocity. And this was true no matter what the ratio of the masses were uh, or what the velocities were. We defined this, the product of the object's mass times velocity, as momentum, and we use a lowercase p to represent that. So in an explosion or, or in a collision, we find out there's just something special about this product of an object's mass and its velocity. So now if we consider each car individually as its own system, let's say the blue car, it goes from some initial momentum to some final momentum in this case positive, and the red car goes from some initial zero momentum to some final momentum as well. So the red car changes its momentum by negative 20 kilogram meters per second, and the blue car changes its momentum by positive 20 kilogram meters per second. The question is, what changed each car's momentum? Well, what causes an object to go from zero velocity to some velocity, and, or zero momentum to some momentum? Well, it has to be explained by forces. So let's see if we can come up with an expression to relate how much force an object feels with how much it changes its momentum. To do that, we're going to use Newton's second law. The acceleration of an object is equal to the sum of the forces it feels divided by its mass. So let's just imagine we have somebody pushing a box uh, using a constant force across a surface and we're going to consider that friction is negligible and let's just say we know how much time they apply that force for. So think about our definition of acceleration. Acceleration is the change in an object's velocity divided by time. So let's put in change in velocity over change in time for acceleration and that's equal to the sum of the forces divided by the mass. Let's cross multiply and see what happens. So we have m times change in v is equal to the sum of the forces times the change in time. This just comes from Newton's second law and our definition of acceleration. Let's change the left side of this equation a little bit. Uh, the change in velocity is the same as the final velocity minus the initial velocity. So it's m times final velocity minus initial velocity. Let's now distribute that m inside the parentheses and so we get mass times final velocity minus mass times initial velocity. And remember, what was our definition of mass times velocity? m times v is an object's momentum. So m times final velocity is an object's final momentum. m times initial velocity is an object's initial momentum, the product of its mass times velocity. And the final momentum minus the initial momentum, that's just the same as an object's change in momentum. And so we can see that the left side of this equation, when we do our rearranging, is just the change in a system's momentum. And that's going to be equal to the sum of the forces the object feels multiplied by the time it feels that force. This is what it looks like on our AP equation sheet, that the change in momentum of a system is equal to the sum of the forces that it feels multiplied by the time it feels that force. Okay. Uh, just to note that this force in the equation, that's the external net force, a force not inside the system, but it's being applied to the system from outside of it. And this delta T is the time while that net force is felt. In physics, we actually have a term for the product of a force times time, and that's actually called an impulse. So we would say that an impulse quantitatively predicts how much a system's momentum will change. When we look at the units of an impulse, it's a force times time, so we get units of newton seconds. 
And the question is, is that the same as units for the change in momentum? Well, remember that a newton is a kilogram times a meter over second squared. So if we multiply that by seconds, notice we get some second units that cancel and we're left over with kilogram meters per second. So a newton second is the same thing as a kilogram meter per second, and that is our unit for momentum. So multiplying a force times time would give us momentum units. Let's see if we can experimentally verify that the product of the force an object feels and the time it feels that force is quantitatively the same as the value of its change in momentum. To do this, we're going to make a one kilogram low friction cart collide with a rigid wall. We will start by using the integrated spring as a cushion during the collision to increase the time the cart makes contact with the wall. A force sensor will be used to measure the size of the force the car experiences during the collision, and a motion detector will be used to measure the cart's change in velocity before and after the collision. So here's what the data shows. You can see that the force sensor is measuring a maximum of six newtons during the impact over a little between two tenths and three tenths of a second the impact lasted. And we want to figure out does the product of a force times time is that quantitatively the same as the change in momentum of the system? Well, the question is, what force would we use uh, over what time? It felt a maximum force of about six newtons over about three tenths of a second, but we can't just take six newtons times two or three tenths of a second because the force the cart felt was apparently not a constant force. That was only the maximum force, not the average force that was felt. So how do we get the value for the product of force times time? Well, it's really actually similar to the way that we found work, which was force times distance. To do that graphically, we had a force versus position graph, and the area was force times distance. We also did this with displacement earlier on, where to find an object's displacement, that's the equal to the product of velocity times time, which if we had a velocity versus time graph, we found the area between whatever was plotted and the x-axis, and that was the displacement. So, if we want the product of force times time, we just need a force versus time graph, which we have, and it turns out that the area on a force versus time graph gives you the product of force and time, which we defined as impulse. So using our graphical analysis software, uh, we found the integral, which is just another word for area between the force that was plotted and the zero force. And so this shaded in red region right here is the area that has a value of negative 0.7828 second newtons or newton seconds. So that shaded area right there is the product of the force the car experienced multiplied by the time it experienced that force even though we have a changing force. So it turns out that was about negative 0.78 newton seconds. So that's the impulse the cart felt. So now the question is, what is the change in momentum of the car? Well, we use our motion detector to plot how the velocity changed over time. Here we can see the cart was moving to the right with velocity of positive 0.4 meters per second. And then the velocity went to zero, and then the velocity got negative, so it sped up in the negative direction to negative 0.35 meters per second. So in this gray region, this is the area where the velocity changed and the momentum changed during the impact. Well, to calculate the change in momentum from our velocity versus time graph, change in momentum is final momentum minus initial momentum, which is mass times final velocity minus mass times initial velocity. And if we group our velocities, we get mass times final velocity minus initial velocity, which is the change in velocity. So the change in momentum is mass times change in velocity. The car had a mass of approximately one kilogram, and the car went from 0.4 meters per second down to negative 0.35 meters per second. So the change was negative 0.75 meters per second. When we multiply the mass times the change in velocity, we can see that the change in momentum is equal to negative 0.75 kilogram meters per second. And when we compare that to the impulse, that's really close, within three hundredths of a kilogram meter per second or newton per second. So we can see that experimentally, uh, 
the product of force times time that an object feels is quantitatively equivalent to how much its momentum will change in kilogram meters per second. Now we'll see what happens when the cart collides with our rigid wall without the use of its integrated spring. So here's our data and a little bit of analysis. So we can see that the cart, it wasn't traveling nearly as fast initially, it was moving 0.23 meters per second, and when it came off of the wall it was moving to the left at negative 0.16 meters per second, so its change in velocity wasn't quite as big. But look at our force versus time graph, that impact happened over a much shorter time, about a tenth of a second or less, and the maximum force the cart felt was about 13 newtons. So over a small time, it felt a really big force, or a much larger force in the last example. When we look at the impulse, which remember is the area on our force versus time graph, that's the shaded red region right here, the impulse was negative 0.36 newton seconds. And when we look at the change in momentum, the change in momentum is negative 0.39 kilogram meters per second. So now we have a second trial experimentally showing that the product of a force times time is the, pretty much the same as the object's change in momentum. When we look at both of our results, so this was collision number one using the spring to increase the time of collision. That impact or that collision happened over a long time and the force was fairly small. So the change in momentum, you can change an object's momentum by using a small force over a long time like in collision number one, or we saw in the second collision where we didn't use the spring that the car changed its momentum with a large force over a small time. So both of these examples show that you can change an object's momentum with a small force over a long time or cause the same change in momentum if you have a large force over a small time. For your homework tonight, now you're going to use the change in momentum and impulse equation to think through different situations, both qualitatively and quantitatively.